Our next guest is leading the Department of Energy's efforts to promote clean energy technologies that will help America achieve President Biden's ambitious goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And prior to that, she served two terms as the governor of Michigan. Please welcome Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm to the South by Southwest studio. Ooh. Uh, Secretary Granholm, can I, may I call you Jennifer? You may. I because encourage it. Because we knew each other. We go way back. <laughs> four years ago, the last time you and I were in the same room without masks was in New York, mm -hmm. right before the pandemic when yep. you and I were CNN contributors. Exactly. And, and now were, look at you now. Uh, well, and look at you. Here we are. South by Southwest studio you host. You can't get and, bigger than this. And you're the head of the Department <laughs> of Energy. But what's uh, what impresses me the most, and, and, your, and your bio, your Wikipedia page is so... It's just obscene. It just goes on forever. You, you, you need to stop, like, you know. Listen. Just stop. Nobody should read that stuff. I didn't put it in there. All sorts of others did. Uh, but you are an alum of UC Berkeley. And that, you know, as always, respect, go Bears. Go Bears. Uh, we're here. There's so much to talk about. Let's start local first. We're in Texas. Okay. Two years ago, as Texans were freezing, some of them were dying. Mm -hmm. Senator Ted Cruz of Texas was in Cancun. Uh, Texans, like so many Americans, are suffering from power outages. Power outages have gone up 60% in the past decade thanks to climate change. For the Texans who are watching right now, it's not a matter of when there will be another outage, or, or, like, or if, it's a matter of when. For those who are listening, how can they stay safe? How can they protect their families? Well, I would say a couple of things. One is they should feel um, that there is hope because the administration is really investing in electricity grids, making mm. them resilient, making your poles stay standing or undergrounding wires that are particularly vulnerable. So that's number one. Number two, interesting, I just came from a meeting where um, the ERCOT, which is the electric grid in Texas, the head of the, the grid, they're actually doing this experiment on something called virtual power plants where they can aggregate all of, for example, batteries for electric vehicles mm. and create, by doing so, create a virtual power plant if you are able to um, take power or take storage from those batteries or send it back to the homes. So it's, it's exciting some of the technology advances that are happening. I will say this, Texas is number one in the country in wind number two in the country in solar. There's a lot of great stuff happening in Texas. All right, so we're talking about Texas, talk about ERCOT. Uh, Texas, for those who don't know, has its own energy grid, all right? Yeah. The nation has its own, but Texas, mm -hmm. like, we're gonna go it alone. Uh, I think it's safe to say that it hasn't gone that well for Texans. Uh, even though it has so much potential, I, I, here's an opportunity. There's the camera. For Republicans who are watching, especially Republican leaders, what pitch can you make them for Texas to perhaps join the nation? Well, well, let me just say this. If you are Texas and you are a Texan who is experiencing one of these extreme weather events and your power goes out, you don't care where your power comes from. Most other states are able to draw from their fellow states around them to be able to send power from one state to another. And I think the country would love to be able to help Texas out. And so if there was a connection, we're not saying the federal government has to come in and regulate the Texas grid, but what we are saying is it would be helpful if there were a connection to the rest of the country so that when times are tough, we can send power to Texas. And all that wind and solar that Texas is generating could send power to the rest of the country and have Texas be a great exporter of clean energy in addition to using it. Huh, the United States of America. Oh, thank you. Huh. <laughs> you these crazy radical thoughts. This Biden administration, look, speaking about the Biden administration, you radicals there. First, you came after Dr. Seuss, right? Then you're coming after pronouns. And now you're coming what after you gas we? stoves. We? <laughs> now you're coming after gas stoves. But in all seriousness, you've heard okay. the right wing talking about, about gas stoves, right? But there are some states and there are some leaders who are recommending that we move away from gas stoves, right? Uh, talk to us about... Well, first of all, is the Biden administration no. coming after gas stoves? The Biden administration I is had to. not this coming. Is, this is an I know. You've got to say it. Of course, of yeah. course, of course, they're not. I will say this: the Department of Energy regulates appliances, and like with all appliances, stoves are one of the things that we are trying to seek additional efficiency on. Mm. So we've put out uh, proposed regulations with respect to increasing efficiency for regular stoves, for gas stoves, for electric stove, et cetera. 
And we are writing the rules to be able to allow people to, if they want to, to be able to purchase a, um, an induction stove. An induction stove is an electric stove. It's actually much safer. Uh, it doesn't have the fumes that are associated with gas stoves. Um, that's all part of the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed. Bravo uh, on that. Well I know. done. Unbelievable stuff happening in that. So um, we're excited about that, but nobody's taking away anybody's gas stove. All right, you heard it here f first. Breaking news. Uh, you have an ambitious plan, you know, net zero carbon emissions, you know, you want to go wind, solar. Uh, this is about the, the future of the human species with, with climate change, mm -hmm. right? We don't have time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to just read what uh, Politico came out with last week. It's talking about the House Republicans that have a slim majority. They are very bullish uh, and they're pushing a massive energy bill, which, according to Politico, includes, quote, boosting fossil fuel production on federal lands, and also disapproving of Joe, President Joe Biden's block on the Keystone XL pipeline. Two, easing environmental reviews of energy and mining projects. So, in light of that, how can the Biden administration achieve this ambitious goal? Okay, the good, reason, good news is that we passed a bunch of bills. Uh, mm -hmm. The bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act over the past... It is a game changer. It is a game changer. Let me just give you one example. Give me more than one. Okay. okay. Well, I mean, first of all, we're seeing deployment of clean energy happen across the country because the incentives embedded in those acts and the inflation reduction are irresistible. So, for example, if you um, are a solar developer, you get a 30% tax credit if you deploy solar. If you're a human being with a house and you want to put solar on your roof, I am you a get human a, being with a house. So you can get a 30% tax credit off of mm. being able to install install those. So both for big solar and little solar. If you want to consider locating in a disadvantaged community, if you would consider using American content for your solar panels, you can get up to a 70% tax credit. That's irresponsible not to do. You know, if you right. are a developer. So it is happening. Another example, we're, you know, we want to we want to be able to build the guts to the electric vehicle, right? That's the batteries for electric vehicles, mm. and and they have largely been made in Asia, largely in China, and extraction of the minerals that go into those batteries, like lithium and cobalt, and the processing of that uh, is largely done in China. Well, the Inflation Reduction Act incentivizes the reshoring of all of those pieces of the supply chain. And since these bills were passed, since the president has been in office, we've had 111 battery manufacturers, just battery manufacturing for electric vehicle companies come or expand in the United States. That is billions, over $80 billion of investment just because of these acts, because it makes the U.S. irresistible to have a manufacturing backbone again, to build up a supply chain, to make it in America. It is really exciting for jobs. It's exciting for the climate. It's exciting for energy security. It's good. And you know about manufacturing in the auto industry. You were the governor of Michigan. Yes. So you know how this can impact lives, livelihoods, and families. I mean, watch. When I was governor, I'm just telling you, we sat there with our arms crossed. We, the country, not us, but the country did, and allowed all of these jobs to go overseas. Mm -hmm. We just decided in the we would bow to the altar of free trade. We would let it go to the lowest wage countries, et cetera, and we wouldn't do anything about it. This president has said, no way. We are going to get that back. We are going to reshore, onshore all of those jobs, not, I mean, it's in, the, in the energy sector, as we possibly can. And it's happening. It's so exciting. So, Solar, wind, you name it. All of those manufacturers are coming back. This is good news. It's but great news. the flip side of this You is, have to have a but in there. Yeah, yeah, no, not a but, not a but, just the reality. The rea yeah. unfortunate reality that we live in is climate change. It's real. At the same time, this ambitious plan, and with the success, we'll give tips of the hat to the Inflation Reduction Act. There was a, a video that came out two years ago. An Exxon lobbyist was caught in a video bragging about undermining President Biden's ambitious agenda. And he said it wasn't a Republican, but the kingmaker, he said, that helps him out is Joe Manchin. And we should be fair that Joe Manchin hasn't come out to say if he's a Democrat or Republican recently. But specifically, the money and the lobbying efforts mm -hmm. of big oil, which made record profits during a pandemic that killed a million folks. Despite everything you're trying to say, despite everything you're trying to do, we have to deal with that reality and that money. How do you combat that influence in politics? Okay, so I just came from Sarah Week, which is a big conference here in Texas, in Houston. And it was historically an oil and gas conference. And now 
it is an energy conference writ large. Mm. And these companies, yes, they made a bunch of money. And yes, they should take those proceeds and invest in clean energy. Some of them actually are. In fact, there are companies like Total used to be a pure oil and gas company, and now they consider themselves a diversified energy company. These companies, for example, one of the one of the coolest forms of clean energy is geothermal energy. I know you're the, big on geothermal. I am. It's hot. I know. It's the heat beneath your feet. You have to drill beneath the subsurface to be able to access the heat that's down there. Who's got the skill set and the knowledge of how to deal with extracting energy from below the surface? It's the oil and gas industry. So if they could take even a slice of those profits, I mean, we don't, you know, companies making profits, that's fine, but take a slice of that, reinvest in the clean side. And some, I mean, I, I say that not if, but some of them actually are. Some of them are investing in offshore wind. Not enough, though. Well, we want, this is why my message to them was, we understand it's important to have energy security, right? We've got a war in Ukraine. Russian supply was taken off the market. We're feeling it with the gas prices. We're, the gas prices went up last year. The president released all of this uh, from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to try to stabilize supply and demand to bring down gas prices. So in the short term, we know that we have to increase production to, to account for that volatility. And we have to increase, uh, you know, we have increased liquefied natural gas, which is the way that the Europeans have mm. been able to heat because Russia just completely crimped that. So for our allies and everything, it's important for in the media to shore up the energy. But Europe, everywhere, they are accelerating this push to clean because they see it as an energy security play, right? And these companies, oil and gas companies, they see this happening. They know that they have got to diversify themselves. But for these company, for these countries, you know, they see access to, they see that no country has ever been held hostage by access to the wind mm. or access to the sun. In fact, really homegrown energy, clean energy could be the greatest peace plan is, the do, world do has ever this known. This is why Donald Trump is really belligerent against the wind. <laughs> Who knows? You know, I'm just really curious. Do you, do you, can you explain why he's just... Why very... would I possibly try to explain anything? That that I, I, it was just a layup. You just gave it to I'm me. Sorry. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was just, I, can't, I couldn't resist. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm an unfrozen caveman lawyer. I'm a simple man. But I have some gray hair uh, and I have some mileage in me. And I know that some companies, uh, instead of doing the right thing, they chase profit. Of course. What's the pitch to them that this in the long run will actually give them money? Um, you can't make the case for saving the earth if that was the case of what it would have done the totally right thing 20 years ago. So just go right to the pocketbook. For their shareholders, it would be irresponsible for these companies not to take advantage of these tax credits from the Inflation Reduction mm. Act. I mean, they're, they are so generous and so irresistible that if you've got capital and you're not investing it to be able to take advantage of that, you're doing a disservice to your shareholders. All right, that, that's, that's appealing to me. Uh, I got to take it back to Berkeley. As I said before, we're both alums. You taught there. Lawrence Livermore, yes. a laboratory last year, came out with this breakthrough. Talk to us about what they did. And if, can you explain it? Because you're a yes. teacher as well. Explain it to the person watching at home why that was such a big breakthrough. Okay, so what happened was we achieved fusion ignition. Now, you see your nuclear reactors around, that, they use a process called fission, and fission means you split atomic particles mm. to be able to generate energy. Fusion is where you fuse them together, and in fusing them together, you take two particles of hydrogen atoms and you fuse them together. If you do it uh, in the right way, actually more energy comes out mm. of that transaction, that reaction, than it took to put in to make that fusion happen. Now, fusion is hard. We've been trying to do it for 60 years. But the Lawrence Livermore National Lab has a facility called the National Ignition Facility. And when you make that fusion happen, it's called achieving ignition. Mm. It's the first time it's ever been happening. Just last year. And just in December, on December 5th of last year. And they did it by pointing 192 huge lasers at a target that is smaller, the the smaller than the elephant, maybe like this size, right. pointed in there to be able to fuse these atomic particles. So it's expensive and it's huge, but here's what it does, is it creates abundant, clean energy with no waste. It is really- That's the game changer. It's the game, it's replicating basically the process that happens in the sun, those nuclear, rea those fusion reactions. But um, right now, 
we need to bring down the cost of it. So the president actually has a 10-year vision, a decadal vision, to see commercial fusion happen. And you can do it with lasers, you can do it with magnets, but the bottom line is this is a scientific game changer. Do you think in our lifetime yes. we'll be able to see this I do. mainstreamed? I do. I do. In fact, I just visited a commercial fusion facility in Massachusetts called Commonwealth Fusion, and they are creating modular their, their goal is they've got a big investment by Bill Gates, et cetera, a lot of excitement. They are creating modular fusion um, manufacturing facility, basically a plant. Um, and their hope is that they're going to be able to achieve that goal within the decade. All right, let's go global. We started local. Uh, the Energy Department, along with another department, the FBI, researchers uh, concluded that it was most likely that COVID came from the labs in Wuhan, right? Four unnamed agency believe the, uh, otherwise. So now we have the Energy Department and the FBI, and we have four unnamed agencies. Americans are confused, and there's disinformation. First off, what led the researchers of the Energy Department to make that explosive statement? Um, let me just say this. This is all highly classified information. Okay. So I am not at liberty to be able to speak about what's under the hood until it's unclassified, and we're not at that place yet. All right. Well, with that. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's fine. But the message then to Americans, right? Because now we have this information. The cat's out of the bag. And you've seen people run well, with Well, the cat really isn't out of the bag. The report hasn't been released. The, uh, some, some, some fur. There's, some there's... fur is out of the bag. <laughs> but but for many, in all seriousness, now we have, this is what we know. And I understand your sensitive situation with the classroom information. But different agencies coming out with different information during a pandemic with which is rife with misinformation, and you've seen the conspiracy theories in the past two weeks. You've seen it. You've heard it. Mm -hmm. So the message to Americans who are confused as hell, what the hell's going on? Well, just know that um, the Department of Energy has 17 national labs, and the president wants to get to the bottom of what happened with this. And so uh, our labs have been working on it like others have been. And so... You know, it's true that agencies might reach different conclusions looking at even the same evidence. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens in terms of when it's released. But the bottom line is there's a lot of really good objective people trying to get to the bottom of it. Uh, I want to talk about accountability. We don't know what's going to happen. But with China specifically, right, um, when we're talking about if it's Wuhan or if it's not, but accountability when it comes to those countries that are doing so much damage. Mm -hmm to the world when it comes to climate change. I hate to say it, it's China, and it's also the United States of America. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we hold China and ourselves accountable for what we're doing around the world? Yeah, I mean, this is a really good point because what we have been trying to do, what Secretary Kerry has been trying to do as the president's climate envoy is to get all of these countries to agree to very aggressive targets to be able to make sure that we don't get climate or global warming happening over uh, you know 1.5 degrees and we we have you know we've raised our hand we said we want to get to net zero by 2050 we are really pushing other countries to do the same and no matter what country you're a member of <laughs> Uh, the countries all are susceptible to pressure, to peer pressure. They don't want to be the outlier. I mean, there's a couple of countries that we know are outliers and don't care. But, but I think China has done, um, has been very sensitive and has actually invested a lot in their solutions uh, to achieve their goals. So we're, we're hopeful that, you know, we can all learn from what China is doing, but the amount of money that they're investing in clean energy is actually, you know, uh, encouraging. Uh, as we say, inshallah, God willing, hopefully inshallah. these countries <laughs> yes. uh, and these companies will do the right thing. I got the final 30 seconds. Uh, I heard that you are up against Jen Psaki, who was just here as a guest. And Jen Damn Psaki it. is talking to Chelsea Handler. Your speeches are competing with each other what? at South By. Look at the camera and tell people why they should go to your speech. Because... It is an existential threat. Do you care about climate change? Do you care about the future for you, for your children? Do you want to know how we can solve it? Through cool technology? I've got a very snappy Prezi that I'm going to snappy be doing. Snappy Prezi? How can anybody turn that down? So come to my speech. <laughs> you all convinced? Yeah. Hey! Oh, the throngs! <laughs> Jen.
Thank Great you so much. You. Secretary Grant Hope speaking today. Today. Today at the Hilton Austin in downtown at the same time as Jen Psaki okay, and Chelsea you do have to advertise But you will now? go see her at Salon H <laughs> at 2.30 p.m. Thank you again for Appreciate coming it. by and stopping at the South by Southwest studio. And thank you all for watching. You can find our complete schedule of interviews on our website at sxsw.com studio. And our studio interviews are also live streaming during the conference on our YouTube channel at youtube.com sxsw. I'm your host, Wajahat Ali. Please stay tuned. There's a lot more to come on our first day of South by Southwest.